thank you for joining us today as we consider the President's fiscal year 2012 budget request for the Department of the Navy. Secretary Mavis, Admiral Ruffhead, good to have you here again. General Amos, welcome for your first uh, hearing here as uh, Commandant. Glad to have you. We want to thank all of you, men, for the tremendous service you perform for our country and for those that uh, wear the uniform behind you and, and behind you elsewhere around the country, around the world. As we review your budget request and reconcile it with the larger DOD efficiencies in if initiative, we can see in many ways the Department of Navy gained capabilities. However, I remain concerned that this request does not fully provide for the Navy and the Marine Corps. I support efforts to identify savings and reinvest those dollars into critical force structure and modernization. But many of the efficiencies identified by your department are cost avoidance initiatives and not clear-cut savings. As such, we're concerned that they, in fact, materialize. Furthermore, over the five-year period that this budget request covers, your department harvested over $42 million in so-called efficiencies, yet had to sacrifice approximately $16 billion of that amount, or 38 percent, back to the Treasury in order to generate much of the savings you've been compelled to make significant force structure cuts. But your requirements haven't changed. For example, the amphibious assault mission remains valid, but you canceled the exp expeditionary fighting vehicle. Likewise, the strike fighter inventory requirement to support the current national defense strategy is 10 aircraft carrier air, air wings containing 50 strike fighter aircraft each. We do not currently meet this requirement, but the budget request puts the F-35B Joint Strike Fighter on a two-year probation, and you've shuttered an aircraft carrier air wing. Similarly, the budget request assumes savings as a result of a decrease in the Marine Corps and end strength of 20,000 personnel before the Marine Corps could even complete its force structure review. Now the Marine Corps suggests it cannot live with that number and can only reduce end strength by 15,000. Finally, you propose to design the Ohio-class replacement ballistic submarine with fewer missile tubes than envisioned by the new START Treaty or STRATCOM. Adding to my concern is that the current battle force inventory is at least 25 ships below your stated 313 ship floor. Although we have not seen the results of the force structure assessment you indicated was underway last year, one can only imagine that the requirements for ships will grow as missions such as anti-piracy and sea-based missile defense expand. Just-in-time replacements for legacy force structures such as the Ford-class aircraft carrier program and the Joint Strike Fighter program are currently behind schedule and over cost causing even more resources to be required to sustain legacy platforms. Your department gives this nation the most flexible and lethal projection of power of any country in the world. It's imperative that we sustain and maintain a robust and effective fighting force born from the sea and that we provide you sufficient resources to do that, which includes finishing the FY11 defense appropriations as you know, that we're, uh, we're, we're really working together to try to see that happen. It's not going to happen this week, but hopefully in the ongoing discussions we can bring that to a, to a good conclusion. Ranking Member Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, gentlemen, for being here this morning and for your service to our country. Uh, we are in a very, very challenging budget environment. Uh, short term, we need to get something done for FY11. I know the pressures that that has, has put on you. It is always helpful to hear specifics about that. Uh, so during your testimony today, it would be good to hear more about sort of what the CR means in terms of limiting your ability to operate, uh, hopefully to uh, spur us all to get that done so that we can have an actual appropriations bill for the Department of Defense. We know that impacts you in many ways. And then beyond that, even once we get through the last seven months of 2011, Going forward, we face enormous budget challenges across the whole of government, uh, and certainly that will have some impact on the Department of Defense. So we're anxious to hear how you plan to manage those. And uh, the Navy and Marine Corps are in 
sort of a unique position. You are the main upfront projection of our power. Uh, the main point of the Navy and Marine Corps is to be ready to go anywhere, anytime, often with very little notice. Uh, so that preparation requires a, you know, a broader array, uh, well, a broader array of preparation to make sure that we're ready for whatever comes at us. You've all done that very, very well in the past and in the future. There will be many, many more challenges along those lines. We continue to have the problems with piracy. Uh, the disruption in the Middle East could give rise to any number of different decisions that we have to make in terms of being able to get into that region in a supportive capacity. And of course, there continues to be major challenges in the CENTCOM AOR um, that require your services. So that ability to project power is critical to our national security. Uh, Navy and the Marine Corps are a critical part of that. So I agree very much with the Chairman's comments about you know, some of the challenges going forward, some of the decisions that have been made about which programs to continue, which programs to cancel, how to make shifts. I uh, look forward to your testimony today uh, to further explain some of those decisions and how exactly they will work out. Uh, pretty much along the lines with what the chairman said, so I will not repeat that. Uh, and I guess the, the last thing I'd like to say, you know, we for quite some time on this committee have talked about the number of ships uh, that are necessary within the Navy. 313 uh, seems to be the magic number. I think it would be helpful for all of us to sort of better understand why. You know, what are the requirements that have led us to say that 313 is the magic number? And then the other piece of that, of course, is uh, you have a lot of different ships. Uh, they're not all created equal. We could conceivably have 313, but still not meet your needs if we don't have the right types of shifts. No, I'm sorry, ships. Uh, so a better understanding of how you see that balance going forward would be helpful for the committee. Uh, and with that, I will yield back, and I look forward to your testimony. And thank you again, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Well, we're happy to have the Honorable Ray Mavis, Secretary of the Navy, Admiral Gary Ruphead, United States Navy, Chief of the Naval Operations, General James F. Amos, United States Marine Corps Commandant, uh, Mr. Secretary. If you'll start it out. Push the button. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Smith, members of the committee, I have the honor of appearing here today on behalf of the sailors, Marines, and civilians that make up the Department of the Navy. I want to mention the absence of Representative Gabby Giffords, who, were it not for the senseless act in January, would be here with us today. She's a member of the Navy family and been a true friend of the Navy and Marine Corps throughout her entire career. And I want to extend the thoughts and the prayers of everybody in the Department of the Navy to her and to her family as she recovers. Today, the Navy and Marine Corps are conducting missions across the full range of military operations. They remain the most formidable expeditionary fighting force the world has ever known. And with your support, they will continue to meet the multiplicity of missions entrusted to them by our nation. Today, as the chairman and the ranking member pointed out, we face an immediate crisis, the absence of a defense appropriations bill, and the increasingly serious problems of operating under a continuing resolution. The pressure of the CR has already significantly impacted procurement and reduce the resources available to maintain readiness. If the CR continues for the entire year, we will be forced to reduce aircraft flight hours and ship steaming days, cancel up to 29 of 85 surface ship maintenance availabilities, defer maintenance on as many as 70 aircraft and 290 aircraft engines defer up to 140 maintenance and construction projects across this country. In addition, the lack of legislative action will prevent the construction of one Virginia-class submarine, two Arleigh Burke destroyers, and one mobile landing platform, prevent procurement of two nuclear reactor cores, and delay increased funding for the Ohio-class replacement. Reduce Marine Corps procurement by up to a third after rebalancing Marine Corps manpower accounts. Create a $4.6 billion shortfall in operation and maintenance accounts and create nearly a $600 million shortfall in combined Navy and Marine Corps manpower accounts. These measures will not only 
place additional stress on the force and our family. They will weaken the industrial base and affect over 10,000 private sector jobs. The, the disruption to our fleet and to our shore maintenance and modernization schedules may take years to recover from and will come at a much greater cost. We strongly request congressional action to address the implications of this continuing resolution. This is particularly important when considering submission of the FY12 budget request, which was based on the FY11 request. The FY12 President's budget request of $161 billion, an increase of only one half of 1 percent over FY11, includes funds for 10, aircraft, for 10 ships and 223 aircraft. It maintains our commitment to take care of our people, build a strong R&D and industrial base, and grow the fleet. The $15 billion request for overseas contingency operations, which represents a drop of $3.5 billion from FY11, includes funds to sustain operations, manpower, infrastructure, as well as procure equipment and support operations in Afghanistan. During the development of this budget, we were keenly aware of the fiscal position of the country and the necessity to be responsible stewards of taxpayer dollars. The resulting request is a strategy-driven document informed by fiscal realities. It balances competing requirements and tries to do what is best for the country, the Navy, the Marine Corps, and our sailors and Marines. We began this budget cycle by examining every aspect of what we do and how we do it. Consequently, $42 billion in Department of Navy efficiencies were identified over the five years. As a result, we have been able to add one Aegis-class destroyer, three TAOX fleet oilers, one TAGOS ocean surveillance ship to our shipbuilding plan. With our dual block LCS strategy, this increases the total number of ships over the next five years from 50 to 56, including one joint high-speed vessel to be built for the Army. The savings also allow us to buy additional FA-18s, extend the service life of up to 150 legacy aircraft as a hedge against delays in the deployment of the F-35B, and allow us to continue investing in unmanned systems, which are becoming increasingly important on the battlefield and unmatched in their ability to covertly surveil hostile forces without placing our own people at risk. This upcoming year, we will see deployment of the Fire Scout to Afghanistan and continued testing of the UCASD, the forerunner of an integrated carrier launch strike system. In 2010, one of the most important efforts was the decision endorsed by Congress to pursue the new littoral combat ship through a dual block buy strategy. At an average cost of less than $440 million per ship, and with the cost reductions we have seen on LCS 3 and 4, the new strategy will save taxpayers $2.9 billion. This plan is one that's good for the Navy, good for taxpayers, good for the country, and demonstrates what can be accomplished when sound acquisition principles are followed and enforced. We heard the message from Congress very clearly. We need more ships but they have to be affordable. The LCS strategy supports the industrial base by keeping workers employed at two shipyards and is indicative of the Department's push to ensure acquisitions ac ec excellence. The fixed price contracts used for LCS are a model. They are a result of effective competition, give the government full ownership of the technical data package used in construction, and afford greater congressional oversight. With the new LCS strategy, we get more ships more quickly, more affordably. Significant additional savings were also achieved through terminating the expeditionary fighting vehicle. It's important to emphasize that this decision in no way changes our nation's commitment to amphibious warfare or an amphibious assault capability. We have to maintain an amphibious assault capability that will put Marines ashore ready for the fight. But the EFV 
is not the vehicle to do this. Conceived in the 1980s, the EFV was the previous generation's solution to a tactical problem that has since fundamentally changed, and its cost per unit would have consumed half the Corps' total procurement and 90 percent of its vehicle-related operation and maintenance account. We simply cannot afford it. In aviation programs, we are also closely monitoring the Joint Strike Fighter, particularly the Marine Corps variant, the B. After a two-year period of focused scrutiny, we will make an informed recommendation about resolving the technical and cost issues. Ashore, we continue to confront rising health care costs caused by an increasing number of beneficiaries, expanded benefits, and increased utilization. To deal with these trends, we have to implement systemic efficiencies and specific initiatives that improve the quality of care and customer satisfaction, but at the same time more responsibly manage costs. We concur with the recommendations made by the Secretary of Defense to ensure fiscal solvency and benefit equity for our retirees. Finally, we are continuing efforts to invest in and develop alternative energy. The latest headlines from around the world reinforce our basic point. Energy is first and foremost an issue of national security. We can't allow volatile regions of the world to control the price and affect the supply of the fuel that we use. Last year, the Navy and Marine Corps took some huge steps forward, including flying the F-A-18 Hornet on biofuel, conducting a large-scale expansion of solar power, and beginning expeditionary initiatives efficiencies and initiatives in Afghanistan. What we are doing there is already saving lives as we reduce our reliance on imported fuel. We will continue these investments this year, and we will continue to move forward toward our goal of at least 50 percent alternative energy use by 2020. In closing, it is a solemn privilege to lead the Naval Services during an era of protracted war and a national challenge. I have been honored by the trust the President and Congress have placed in me and profoundly moved by the sacrifice and devotion I have witnessed in the sailors and Marines who defend us. The Navy and Marine Corps are and will remain ready to do any mission America gives them. Thank you and Godspeed. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. Admiral? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman McKeon, Ranking Member Smith, and members of the committee, it is my honor to appear before you in my fourth year as the Chief of Naval Operations, representing more than 600,000 sailors, Navy civilians, and their families who operate and live globally. I appreciate your continued support for them and their families as they continue to carry out our maritime strategy. I, too, would like to echo the Secretary's comments and thoughts with regard to Representative Giffords all of us who serve wish her the very best in a speedy recovery. Our Navy continues to meet operational commitments and respond to crises as they emerge. We are engaged in Iraq and Afghanistan with 14,000 sailors on the ground and another 14,000 at sea in the region. Thirty percent of the air support over Afghanistan flies off the decks of our aircraft carriers. But our presence in the Middle East also uh, gives us the flexibility to respond to the sweeping changes that we see taking place there. But our interests extend far beyond that, and so do our operations. Today, we have approximately 65,000 sailors deployed and about 40 percent of our force structure. We are globally present and we are persistently engaged. We provide deterrence in Northeast Asia and a presence in the Western Pacific. We can conduct counter-piracy operations in the Indian Ocean, and we are building maritime partnerships in Africa, South America, and the Pacific. The demand continues to grow for the offshore option our Navy and Marine Corps team provides the nation. We assume the lead for the first phase of the phased adaptive approach for ballistic missile defense in Europe, and we are working with the Missile Defense Agency on providing that same capability ashore. We have created the new Information Directorate on my staff, and that has enabled us to make better decisions and investments in countering anti-access and area denial threats. We recently established the Tenth Fleet, our cyber fleet, and it has already demonstrated its expertise by conducting joint and naval operations in the cyber, network, cryptology, and space arenas. 
To deliver the above, we've been pushing the fleet hard. We have 288 ships today, the smallest it has been since 1916, when our interests and responsibilities were nowhere near what they are today. And that's why 313 ships remains the floor of our future force. It also is why sustaining fleet capacity is essential in reaching that floor. Since I became CNO, I focused on ensuring the Navy is ready, that our quality of work and quality of life are fulfilling to the men and women of our Navy, and that we place underperforming programs back on track. We have introduced stability, affordability, and capacity into our shipbuilding and aviation plans, and with the assistance of Congress, we have advanced capabilities to meet the most likely evolving threats. We've secured, as the Secretary mentioned, a fixed price dual award for 20 littoral combat ships. We've addressed our strike fighter capacity with a multi-year FAA 18 procurement. Pending resolution of the continuing resolution, we will build two Virginia-class submarines per year, another guided missile destroyer. We'll start the mobile landing platform, construct and refuel our aircraft carriers as planned, and continue the design of our replacement strategic deterrent submarine. I'm pleased with our accomplishments, and I thank the Congress for their continued support of our acquisition strategies. Our fiscal year 12 budget request is a balanced approach to increasing fleet capacity, maintaining warfighting readiness, and developing and enhancing our Navy total force. The budget goes beyond ships and aircraft. It enhances electronic warfare, information dominance, integrated air and missile defense, and anti-submarine warfare capabilities for the evolving challenges. It continues to develop a family of unmanned systems that will work in concert with our manned systems to secure access and establish maritime superiority when and where we choose. It continues our effort over the last two years to reduce total ownership costs and leverages the opportunity presented by the Secretary of Defense's Efficiency Initiative to reduce excess overhead, improve readiness, and reinvest in warfighting capability and capacity that improves the long-term sustainability of our force. Importantly, it supports the Secretary of Defense's health care initiatives included in the President's budget, which continue our efforts in health care to improve internal efficiency, incentivize behavior, and ensure all our beneficiaries are treated equitably. We're seeing high satisfaction with our medical home port initiative and I'm comfortable with the changes to propose fees and co-payments, including indexing enrollment fees to a medical inflation index, incentivizing beneficiaries to use the most cost-effective prescription delivery methods, and the elimination of sole community hospital status. These are gradual, fair, and equitable changes that enhance our ability to deliver high-quality health care for years to come. You can be exceptionally proud of our sailors and Navy civilians, who they are and what they do. Today's sailors are the best with whom I have ever served. I ask for your strong support of our fiscal year 2012 budget request, and I thank you for all you do to support the men and women who make our Navy the enduring global force for good. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Admiral. General? Chairman McKeon, Ranking Member Smith, and members of the committee, it's my honor to appear before you today for the first time as the Commandant of the Marine Corps to articulate the posture of your Corps. Today, the Corps serves as America's expeditionary force and readiness, a balanced air-ground logistics team of 202,000 active, 39,600 reserve, and 35,000 civilian Marines. Our ability to serve as our nation's principal crisis response force is due in large part to this committee's and Congress's strident, continued strong support. I thank you for that. Today, there are roughly 32,000 Marines forward deployed around the world. As we sit here, it's roughly 7.50 in the morning, or excuse me, in the evening in Afghanistan. The rainy season has hit. The evenings remain cold and damp. It's in this nation where 20,000 of our young men and women are engaged in full spectrum combat operations and counterinsurgency operations. I'm encouraged by the significant progress that they have made in the Helmand province and you have my assurance that this effort remains my top priority. Sergeant Major Kent and I spent Christmas with our Marines and our sailors in Afghanistan. And I'm happy to report that their morale is high and belief in their mission remains strong. Partnered with the United States Navy, we are forward deployed and forward engaged. 
This past year alone, our afloat forces conducted humanitarian assistance missions in Pakistan, Haiti, and the Philippines. We recaptured the pirated ship Magellan Star, rescuing its crew from Somali pirates, and partnered with allied forces in engagement missions in the Pacific Rim, Latin America, Africa, and throughout Eastern Europe. Halfway around the world this morning, Marines are ready, honing their skills on board our Navy's great capital ships, prepared to do our nation's bidding. Such a role as America's crisis response force necessitates that we maintain a high state of readiness. You're either ready to respond to today's crisis with today's force today, and thus, or you risk being late and thus being irrelevant. I am keenly aware of the fiscal realities confronting our nation. During these times of constrained resources, the Marine Corps remains committed to being the best stewards of scarce public funds. We maintain a long-standing tradition in Congress as the Department of Defense's penny pinchers. Our institutionalized culture of frugality positions us as the best value for the defense dollar. For approximately 8.5 percent of the annual defense budget, the Marine Corps provides the nation 31 percent of its ground operating forces, 12 percent of its fixed-wing tactical aircraft, and 19 percent of its attack helicopters. This year's budget submission was framed by my four service-level priorities. We will, number one, continue to provide the best trained and equipped Marine units to Afghanistan. Two, rebalance our Corps and posture it for the future. Three, better educate and train our Marines to succeed in increasingly complex environments. And four, finally, keep faith with our Marines, our sailors, and our families. While these priorities will guide our long-term plan for the Marine Corps, there are nonetheless pressing issues facing our Corps today that concern me, issues for which I ask Congress's continued assistance in solving. Our equipment aboard, abroad and at home stations has been heavily taxed in the nearly 10 years of constant combat operations. The price tag for reset is $10.6 billion, of which $3.1 billion has been requested in FY11 and $2.5 billion is being sought in FY12. The remaining $5 billion bill will be needed upon the completion of our mission in Afghanistan. The F-35B Stovall Joint Strike Fighter is vital to our ability to conduct expeditionary operations. Continued funding and support from Congress for this program is of utmost importance. During the next two years of F-35B scrutiny, I will be personally involved with the program and closely supervising it as the Commandant of the Marine Corps. Both the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of the Navy have reaffirmed the necessity of the Marine Corps' amphibious assault mission. We must develop an affordable and capable amphibious combat vehicle to project Marines from sea to land in permissive, uncertain, and in hostile environments. I ask for your support to reach this goal. To ensure that the Marine Corps remains a relevant force with the capacity and capability to respond to the demands of the future security environment, we recently, recently conducted a detailed and internally driven force structure review. The results of this effort provide America a strategically mobile, middleweight force optimized for forward presence and rapid crisis response. As we look to the future, the Marine Corps is committed to finding ways to be more energy efficient. Since 2009, we have aggressively pursued energy efficient capabilities that will make Marine units more energy self-sufficient, increase our combat effectiveness, and protect our lives. Two weeks ago, I signed our new Basis to Battlefield Energy Planning Guidance, which sets goals and metrics in a plan to implement just that. Finally, I would like to comment on the impact the current continuing resolution has had on our operations and programs. As of today, $565 million in military construction contracts have not been awarded. $2.4 billion of MILCON is at risk for the remainder of the year for the Marine Corps. These projects impacts the lives of Marines, the local economies of the communities around our bases and stations, and are projected to generate over 63,000 jobs from the Carolinas to Hawaii. If the continuing resolution extends through the entire fiscal year, 13 bachelor enlisted quarters, totaling 5,000 affected spaces, will not be built, thus stymieing our BEQ modernization efforts. These 13 bachelor enlisted quarters will allow eight infantry battalions to move out of 50-year-old Cold War barracks. 
Finally, a continuing a resolution could prove catastrophic to our procurement accounts, resulting in the loss of almost a third of our procurement budget. Lastly, you have my promise that in these challenging times ahead, the Marine Corps will only ask for what it needs, not what it might want. We will make the hard decisions before coming to Congress, and we will redouble our efforts toward our traditional culture of frugality. As has been the case for over 235 years, your Marine Corps stands ready to respond when the nation calls wherever the President may direct. Once again, I thank each of you for your continued support. I ask that my written testimony be uh, submitted for the record, and I'm prepared to answer your questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, General. Thank you to each of you. Um, just a couple of things on the, uh, on the CR. If that had been taken care of last year in regular order, we wouldn't even be discussing it now. But as a, it is what it is. And uh, I know we're all of the members on this committee in strong support of, of getting this, uh, this work finished up. Uh, in, the, in the process of the CR, the, the appropriators and the leadership have separated out the defense, and they are working to, uh, to bring that to a resolution, and then all the other issues will, will be dealt with in one large omnibus package. But the, uh, the defense, we are trying to finish up that appropriation bill, and, and I know every week that goes by causes more problems. So hopefully we can get that wrapped up quickly. Uh, General, I just uh, returned. Uh, Mr. Reyes and Mr. Klein and myself went to uh, Afghanistan. I know other members of the committee have just returned over the last break from, from Afghanistan, and, and I was very impressed with the morale of the Marines down at uh, Marja and, and in, the, in the south down there with the job that they have done. And those young captains were so excited to show us uh, what they were doing and what they, uh, what they had accomplished. And, and, and I, was, I was really impressed by, by their attitude, by their professionalism, and by the way that they are carrying out their responsibilities. And uh, it, it was just, it was a great experience uh, for me. And I saw a lot of progress from a year and a half ago to now, when the Marines had just gotten to Camp Leatherneck, were just starting to move out to where now they've, uh, they've freed up most of that area and uh, done an outstanding job. The uh, concern I had, and I mentioned it in, in my opening statement, the out years uh, Department of the Navy budget plans for Marine Corps end strength of 182,000 personnel. However, the Marine Corps force structure assessment just released states a requirement for an end strength 5,000 personnel over that amount. What is your out year budgeting strategy for adding back the additional $500 million required to accommodate an additional 5,000 personnel? Congressman, that, as you recall, that sits out there in, in year 15 and 16 is when the, uh, when the budget was uh, adjusted and it was 10,000 a year. What was the drawdown? That was proposed at the time. Now, there's recognition within uh, the Department of Defense that it's not, it, it's not 20,000. Now, what I've asked uh, uh, our leadership is to allow me to meter down that manpower to avoid uh, reductions in forces and to keep, uh, keep faith, my last priority, keep faith with my families uh, at Sailors and our Marines. So, uh, yet to be seen precisely how that drawdown will take place. The, the uh, Secretary of Defense and Secretary of the Navy have have assured me that it will be conditions-based. In other words, it's, it's designed to be post-Afghanistan uh, when the Marines are out of Afghanistan. So based on that, uh, there will probably be some adjustments as we move into Palm 13 and Palm 14 as we work those budgets. So right now we don't have, as you, as you note, we don't have the solution to that 5,000 yet, but we will be working that as we build the 13 budget and as we build the 14 budget, sir. I understand it's very difficult for us to look out a year, especially when we haven't even finished up last year's work. Uh, so it is difficult, but I, 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 I've heard also that that is conditions-based, and we will take care of this one year at a time um, as, best, as best we can. 
Uh, on the uh, SSBNX program, uh, the Navy's de determined that designing an Ohio-class ballistic missile replacement submarine with 16 missile tubes is more affordable than de designing it for uh, the current missile requirement of 20 missile tubes for submarine. You know, one of the things I'm really concerned about is we've, we've just eliminated the EFV. We've eliminated uh, most of what we had planned for in F-22s. Uh, when I first came here, we had cut the B-2 from 130 to 20. Uh, and, and there have been a lot of programs started. And, it, and the excuse for, the, for eliminating the EFV is because now we can't afford it. Well, I don't know when we determined that because we've been working on it for 20 years. What my concern is now on, on this, on this uh, submarine program is that 20 years from now, are we, I mean, if you look at it right now and realistically look at the budget, we're not going to be able to afford it even at this reduced number of 16 silos. Are we? Or do you feel that uh, that, that will be affordable with all the other things that are needed for the Navy? Mr. Chairman, as we look forward, as you know, the Ohio class replacement, we have to start building in 2019 to go on patrol in 2029, uh, its first patrol. So what we're doing today is trying to come up with the best R&D, the best design that we can, and to get the cost into a, a, a manageable range. Uh, we've taken a billion dollars per boat out uh, within the last year, and we are looking for another half billion per boat. And the reason for that is twofold. One is to give us the best deterrent capability because uh, the Ohio class and its replacement are the most survivable legs of the nuclear triad. But it's also to keep from uh, hollowing out our fleet uh, as we start to build these replacement submarines uh, because they do take such a large part of our shipbuilding budget. Uh, and to show what that will do in our long range, in our long range plans. Uh, we have one of the things that I have uh, committed to and I think we've stuck to is to be very realistic in terms of how much something will cost, how much we can anticipate the, a range that we can anticipate that uh, Congress will provide for shipbuilding and to work within those means. But I do think that the Ohio class replacement that we are designing um, will be, well, it's absolutely necessary and we need to make it affordable so that we can both have that deterrence and also have the rest of the fleet that we're going to need um, in the next uh, 20, 30, 40 years. I think we're in agreement on the need. What my concern is that somewhere down the line, I mean, one of the ways we got the billion dollar saving is just cut it from 20 to 16 tubes. You, we cut the, the capability of the ship to save money. And that, that, that makes me a little nervous about how, how we're going to be able to really provide all of our needs. It just, across the board, I see our defense needs being driven by budgetary concerns rather than to meet potential crises that might confront us at some point down the line. The, um, the number of tubes designed in today for the Ohio class replacement meets every um, contingency that we know of today. It meets every targeting um, design that we, that we will be tasked with. Uh, we also, um, as technology changes, uh, we are able to reduce the number of those submarines from 14 to 12 because now we're, we will be building a life of the hull reactor so that there won't be the need to pull uh, two submarines at a time out for uh, refueling. Uh, they will be able to stay on patrol 
for their entire lifetimes without refueling. So as the technology changes, uh, we, we will absolutely meet the needs, but try to do it within the fiscal realities that, that we confront. Thank you. Ranking Member Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I certainly appreciate the difficulties of operating under CR in the 2011 budget and share the Chairman's concerns, want to make sure we go forward. It is worth pointing out that the House did, in fact, pass a 2011 Defense Appropriations Bill. Also worth pointing out, actually, that the Senate on more than one occasion had a defense and other appropriations bills as well. But the, the filibuster is a very powerful tool to stop things from happening. Uh, one of the things that I'm committed to, I think this full committee is uh, committed to, is working together across party lines to, to get something done. Uh, but certainly the House fulfilled its obligation, and we are trying to get an appropriations bill done still. Uh, we're going to work together to make that happen. I um, also want to say I was in Afghanistan at the end of November and very, very impressed with what the Marine Corps has accomplished. Uh, we were taken down to Hell Mountain Province, Let's walked through a village down there that, you know, a mere matter of months before, no one could have walked through safely, um, and we were able to do that, meet with the village leaders down there. The Marine Corps has done a fabulous job, you know, taking back territory and making a real difference and at, at a very high cost as well, which we're all aware of. So we, we thank you for your leadership and we thank all. Uh, the Marines and Helmand for their incredible service to our, to our country in moving that forward. Um, on the budget question, I, I think I share the Chairman's concerns, you know, broadly going forward, how are we going to meet the requirements that are out there? One of the things that I would hope you all would do and everyone in working on Department of Defense issues from this point forward is go back and look, look at the requirements very closely. Um, I think that is really the key to making it fit within the budget. You know, what, what are requirements that have been there for a long, long time and are just still sort of there because they've always been there? And what are the real requirements in the 21st century for what we're going to need to meet our national security needs? I think that's going to be a big part of the challenge um, to make sure that we can fund what we need to fund by making sure that we're not funding things that we don't need to fund. And those are some tough questions that I think the people, you know, you three are certainly some of the most qualified people out there to answer those questions, as are others at the DOD. I think we're going to need to take a hard look at that um, on all sides of this equation, so I hope we will do that. Um, I want to thank you also for your kind words on behalf of uh, Congresswoman Giffords. Uh, we appreciate that. Um, she is getting better every day, and we are really looking forward to the day on this committee when she comes back. Um, she's a valuable member of this committee, uh, and she will be back soon, uh, back working on those issues. So I appreciate that. Also, I'm going to ask a couple questions that her staff has given me um, about issues that she's concerned about. And then I have just one, one question of my own. As you know, uh, Congresswoman Giffords is a leader on alternative energy and any efi energy efficient issues well, across all of government, but particularly within the DOD. Um, and the Navy, um, the Navy and the Marine Corps have been just outstanding leaders on this issue. Uh, previous hearing, we discussed a little bit the Marine Forward Operating Base uh, that figured out a way to better use solar power so that they could reduce their fuel consumption, and in reducing their fuel consumption, uh, reduce the number of shipments that had to be made. And every time anyone has to drive, um, they are at risk of an IED. So reducing that uh, doesn't just save energy and money, it actually saves lives. And we appreciate that leadership. And then, of course, we also have the, uh, the Super Hornet that flew with a 50-50 mix of biofuels. Um, had to call it the Green Hornet. The name was just out there. It was very easy um, and very clever. Uh, so we really appreciate your leadership in those issues. A couple of specific questions. Um, how scalable is all of this? Because I think that's one of the, the, the blocks that stops people from fully embracing uh, alternative energy, energy efficiency. It's like, yeah, there's a good idea here, a good idea there, but w what's it really mean? How much does it really save? I'm, I'm a true believer, as is Congresswoman Giffords, uh, that if we do this and do this aggressively, it is very scalable. Uh, it can save us an enormous amount of money. But can you give us some idea of what, where you think this can go? How far can we go with using alternative fuels? And Secretary Mavis, if you'd start off, that'd be great. I think it's very scalable, Congressman. I believe that we will reach our goal of at least 50 percent alternative energy or non-fossil fuel energy, both afloat and ashore, by 2020. Um, you mentioned the Marines. You know, General Amos has signed out his plan to aggressively move these things forward into the combat zone. Uh, it, we import fuel more than any single thing into Afghanistan. Um, as you pointed out, we save money. 
by producing energy on site, we save lives because Marines are not guarding fuel convoys, and we free up Marines to do what they were sent there to do, which is fight or engage or rebuild. Um, on the Navy side, we have we've looked at two things. One is energy efficiencies, simply driving down the amount of energy that we use. You know, things like hull coatings and voyage planning tools, things like that. We've also launched our first hybrid ship and we're uh, gonna, gonna do more in terms of hybrid drives, using electric drives for lower speeds. And those, uh, the Macon Island, our first hybrid ship, in its maiden voyage from Mississippi around South America to California saved almost $2 million in fuel cost. Uh, so we believe that is very scalable. Uh, as you said, we've flown the F-18 and certified it on a 50-50 blend of biofuel. Uh, we've also certified our helicopters, we've certified our swift boats, and we're in the process of certifying our large surface combatants on, um, on biofuels. Uh, we believe that as the market increases, particularly from the Navy and Marine Corps, that uh, prices are coming down. We're seeing that happening already today, and that infrastructure will be built to support this. So we think it's absolutely scalable, and not only scalable, but absolutely ne necessary uh, for our national security. Right. Gentlemen, do you have anything you wish to add? Um, yes, sir. I, I agree with the Secretary. Uh, two years ago, when we established Task Force Energy in the Navy, uh, we started looking at where we could go, and, and that led to the Green Hornet and to taking our inventory, putting it on alternative fuels. Uh, I've been very pleased with what I've seen. My recent updates uh, indicate to me that it is scalable, that costs are coming down. I also believe that there is an expanding interest out in the commercial sector. Um, which is going to be critical uh, and I think will be imperative. Uh, and that will contribute to bringing these costs down. Uh, we are uh, continuing to press forward with the objectives that the Secretary has laid out, and I'm encouraged by what I see, but I am also encouraged uh, by the energy that our people are putting into this. Uh, and I think the cultural change is equally as important as some of the technical things that we see coming along. That's terrific. Congressman, the uh, uh, CNO talked about cultural change, and that's, I think that's really the, the hinge point, uh, probably for all services, certainly within mine. Uh, at the lowest level, if you can get the young captains and uh, corporals excited about not having to carry extra batteries uh, up into the mountains on patrol, uh, such as the uh, India Company, 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines up in Sangin, uh, who have been in a, a pretty tough fight for the last four months. Uh, they went for 90 days uh, just recharging their batteries that we would normally resupply uh, on an almost uh, daily basis, uh, just using their solar roll-up blankets that they had, to the point where they, where they built their combat outpost and uh, strung out all their stuff and then realized they liked it better than having generators run and having to haul water and have, having to haul fuel up there and then batteries resupply. So, it's a culture change for us. It's catching on. Two Fridays ago, I sat with a Marine Colonel at a, at a Black Engineer of the Year Award, and he was the award winner from Albany. And he, uh, he was bragging about this new methane gas uh, uh, energy uh, generation capability that they have at Albany. And they're using the trash and the dump and uh, using all the landfill and then harvesting out the methane to run the generators. But, and we've been doing that at Miramar now for several years, but that he's taken it to the next step. He's, he's captured the exhaust and the heat generated by this generator that's run on methane gas to develop steam and provide heat uh, for the base. So it's, it's a culture change. I, I think, I think uh, we're not there yet, but I'm very, very encouraged. And my, my sense is, is that probably all our services uh, are about ready to, uh, to kind of jump off the edge of this thing. So I'm very encouraged by it. Terrific. Thank you. One question, and you can submit this uh, for the record to my staff. You mentioned the other services. That was the last question, was how, how the different services are cooperating on this. Because everywhere I go, you know, Army, Navy, Marine, Air Force, everyone's got sort of creative ideas. I want to, I'm curious what sort of synergy is going on so that you're learning from each other as you go um, and, not, and not duplicating. So if you could just have your staff submit something both to my office and uh, Congressman Gifford's office, that would be great. Um, the only question that I had was on uh, something you've um, 
mentioned in your, your testimony about how we've changed now um, with the aircraft carrier groups. You're reducing the air wings and the associated staff. There are 11 aircraft carrier um, and you're going down to nine strike groups and air wings and the staff and I are not quite clear on exactly how that's going to work or what impact that might have on your capability um, and how you feel that is going to play out. We understand the budget savings want to make sure it can still work to fully support those 11 aircraft carriers. Um, yes, sir. I think a lot of the uh, questions that have arisen over uh, taking out structure in the Navy really gets to some of the headquarters elements that we're talking about. As I looked across the Navy uh, and, and looked at how we were uh, uh, overseeing the operational forces, uh, quite frankly, in my opinion, we had too much overhead structure. That structure tends to be more senior and therefore more expensive. Um, but if you look at our ability to still field the 10 carrier air wings, that is there. What we have done is, is in the submarine community, the destroyer community, and the aviation community, we've taken out overhead headquarters, senior people, so that we could get more junior sailors back at sea in positions that really make a difference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Bartlett. Thank you. It has um, all the characteristics of a perfect storm. There's general agreement that the world has now reached that point that the United States reached 40 years ago. That is the peak oil, where you have reached your maximum ability to produce oil. This happens at just the time that the industrialized world is struggling to recover from a recession and demanding more oil. The developing world, led by China and India, are demanding hugely increased amounts of oil. There is now escalating unrest in the Arab world, where most of the world's oil reserves are. And a couple of weeks ago, WikiLeaks indicated that uh, Saudi Arabia has 40 percent less oil reserves than they were uh, claiming. That's probably true of most of the uh, uh, OPEC countries that we believe increase their projected reserves so that they could pump more oil. And all this is happening at the time that the world has quite clearly reached its maximum ability to produce oil. We are not going to produce more than about 84, 85 million barrels a day. What's the world's response to this? The leadership in our country seems largely unaware of these challenges. We have only 2% of the world's oil we use 25% of the world's oil, and we're buying reserves nowhere in the world. China is now very aggressively buying oil reserves all over the world. Why would they do that? In today's marketplace, there's no advantage to owning the reserves because you can go to the global oil auction and buy all the oil that you can afford whether or not you have any reserves in your country. We buy 25% of the world's oil. We have only 2% of the world's reserves of oil. There's only one reason I can think of that you would want to own oil reserves, and that is that the time will come when you're not going to be willing to share those reserves with the rest of the world. If that is China's goal, then they need to be able to protect the uh, sea lanes. Just a bit ago, they uh, fielded a uh, very sophisticated anti-ship missile. We're struggling to uh, develop defenses against that. Just quite recently, uh, we saw their J-20, very large fighter, there is a suggestion that it really wasn't designed as a fighter aircraft, that it was designed to uh, release wave-skimming supersonic anti-ship cruise missiles. What do you make of these confluence of events, and what contingency plans are you pursuing? Congressman, on the energy question. Uh, I think you made 
the point about not relying on fossil fuels and particularly imported fossil fuels more eloquently than I ever could. Um, what we are doing is trying to move as rapidly as possible the Navy and the Marine Corps off dependence on fossil fuels, move them to American-based alternative fuels, both um, for expeditionary purposes, for uh, afloat purposes, and for basing purposes. Uh, we have a goal, and we're going to meet it, of, use, of having at least half the Navy and Marine Corps total energy coming from non-fossil fuel sources by the year 2020. Uh, we absolutely think that it is a matter of national security, of energy independence, that we not be dependent on this. It's also simple finances. Every time the cost of oil goes up a dollar a barrel, it cost uh, us $31 million. Uh, so if oil goes up $30 a barrel, you're talking about spending an additional billion dollars just on fuel. The Navy has always been a leader in terms of changing the types of fuel that we use. We went from sail to coal in the 1850s, from coal to oil in the early part of the 20th century, and we pioneered nuclear in the 1950s. And we're going to do that again. That's our, our plans, and it's because we need a hedge against exactly what you were talking about to maintain our war fighting capabilities. I'd like for the CNO to talk about the specific operational things that we are doing um, about the other part of the question. Uh, yes, sir, and thank you for the question, and uh, I echo the Secretary's comments on and, and, and what really is behind our, our energy initiatives. It really is an operational issue and, and, and less a technical issue for me. I mean, it's, it's really about how we operate and how unencumbered we can be if we get off the foreign oil. The, uh, with regard to the capabilities that are, are being fielded, you cited China, but quite frankly, uh, many of those capabilities tend to proliferate today more than they have in the past. So as I look at uh, what we as a Navy um, must be able to do, it really has a global um, uh, view uh, and not just about China. But in all areas, uh, as we look at uh, capabilities that are being developed, as we have over the years, we look at what are the counters to those, what are the strengths that we as a Navy have. Um, and we amplify on those strengths and we address those areas that we know we want to uh, pursue counters to. Uh, I think uh, in the area of, um, of anti-submarine warfare, for example, which is, is one that is uh, submarines are proliferating globally, uh, there is no better anti-submarine warfare weapon uh, than the Virginia-class submarine. Um, and that's why we want to get to two a year this year. If the CR is lifted, we can do that. Uh, but that is, is hugely critical. Uh, we have made significant investments in ballistic missile defense, uh, increasing the number of ships in our inventory uh, up to 41 by the end of this um, uh, defense plan. We also have restructured ourselves within the Navy. We've recreated the, the uh, U.S. 10th Fleet to go after areas of electronic warfare, um, electronic attack, and uh, cyber warfare. And so what we have done is we've, we've reimagined the future. We have in, reinvented ourselves to be able to address those uh, challenges that are likely going to be occurring in the years ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Reyes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, welcome, and thank you for your, for your service. I've got two main areas that I'd like for you to address uh, uh, in, in the five minutes allotted to me. Um, as, as we talked the last couple of days about uh, the uh, possibility of a no-fly zone over Libya uh, and the ability to enforce that, uh, and, and there's a couple of options. NATO has been mentioned the United Nations uh, authority is the other. Um, when we're talking about the 
the constraints, uh, the op tempo, and all the things that impact our, our Navy today, uh, the Navy would be the only option to be able to impose that no-fly zone over, over a place like Libya. Uh, am I correct? Uh, that would depend, uh, Mr. Reyes, on, on basing rights, overflight rights. But to your point, we in the Navy don't have to worry about those because we come from the sea. We don't ask permission where we put our airfields. We put them where they're needed. Uh, so we are a very good option for that. But there are other factors that, that I think uh, leadership would have to take into account. Right. Well, my point being, and, that, and, and it goes to the question that the ranking member uh, talked about in terms of uh, going to nine carrier wings versus the ten. Uh, when we have unexpected uh, emergencies or, or uh, situations that come up, uh, will, in your mind, will we be able to handle those kinds of things, given, given the fact that uh, we're, we've got these worldwide commitments and basically the Navy would be the best option uh, in terms of being able to project that uh, capability? Uh, yes, sir, we are. Today we have four aircraft carriers deployed. Uh, two more are underway. Um, and, and what we do with the fleet is we have it so that it is always forward um, and, and, and that we can move those carriers very quickly from one region to the other. Um, and that's, that's the beauty of how we have desi designed our fleet response plan. Uh, so I feel very comfortable with that. I also believe that what we have put in place with respect to our strike fighter force, um, the, the, the service life extension on the airplanes, the procurement of some additional uh, uh, ENF model Hornets, and then moving to the joint strike fighter, uh, that the Air Force that we have, particularly when we couple with the Marine Corps uh, and their Hornet Force and what will also be a joint strike fighter force, that will be well positioned for the future. Okay. Thank, thank you, Admiral. Uh, uh, General, I have one uh, question, and, and again, I'm, I was as uh, impressed with uh, the uh, uh, change in, in conditions in uh, uh, southern Afghanistan, particularly in the area where the Marines, uh, where we were wondering what, were they going to be able to take it back. But one of the, uh, we, we heard a, a uh, very moving story about uh, an IED attack on one of, the, one of the units, and I guess it was the convoy commander that got hit the hardest on there. Uh, but uh, clearly, one of the big issues, which is also affects the Army, is the traumatic brain injury. Can you address uh, specifically in terms of the Marine Corps the kinds of uh, uh, programs or what you're doing to uh, address TBI? Congressman, I'd be happy to. Uh, this has been evolutionary, and I know that you're close to General Corelli. When I was the Assistant Commandant of the Marine Corps, we worked for, both uh, General Corelli and I worked for two years uh, in, in Ernst, trying to uh, capitalize on all on the latest technology as far as being able to determine uh, what is traumatic brain injury, what is it, what are the effects of that um, on that on that mass inside that skull? Uh, we have come a long way since 2003, when uh, uh, when quite honestly nobody was even talking about TBI. Uh, in a nutshell, today uh, we we recognize it. We understand some of it. We don't understand all of it. We've taken lessons learned from the National Football League, worked very closely with the uh, University of California, Los Angeles, the uh, head of the traumatic brain injury uh, uh, out there, Dr. David Hobda, and using that as a, uh, and bringing in great minds across the country that, that understand this. Um, we built uh, about two years ago, about a year and a half ago, uh, what we call a concussive protocol. And what that means is recognition, first of all, that a concussive event of any kind that, 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 that either knocks a Marine down, perhaps, or throws him up against the wall, or worse yet, he's standing uh, five meters away from his buddy that steps on a, uh, on a, uh, a pressure-plated IED uh, that goes off. 
all that has a great effect on the brain. Each brain is different. Uh, it's affected different. So what we've done now using this protocol is we've brought every single Marine, and it's happened to every single soldier now that, that, that this happens to in uh, Afghanistan. You enter this protocol. In other words, you, you have the event. It's registered. You come back uh, to your combat outpost, uh, forward operating base, wherever you are. You see the corpsman, medic in the case of the Army. The next person is the doctor, uh, if there's one available. Depending on the extent of the injuries, we will fly our Marines from our forward operating base, our combat outpost, into Leatherneck. Uh, and they start this procedure where we do a, uh, uh, an exam of the head. There is a physical examination. And then there is a cognitive test, a series of cognitive tests over days. And depending on how you, how, uh, whether you were knocked out, depending on how you feel, depending on how you look with uh, regards to the examination dictates what the next step is. But in a nutshell, this is, this is, this is the, the, uh, what we've discovered, is the brain needs to be rested after a concussive event. The very best thing you can do is take the brain and put it at rest. In that case, it's keep it in the combat outpost, keep it at the forward operating base, or fly it back to a resuscitative, not a resuscitative, but a, a, a care unit, which we've established at the Leatherneck. And then depending on how long it, uh, you were knocked out or how severe it is, dictates how long it is before you go outside the wire again. You could conceivably never leave what we call the wire of the combat outpost again. In our case, we have what's known as three strikes you're in, which means on the third concussive event, you're not going anywhere. You're not going out on patrol anymore. You're not leaving the wire. Uh, so th these are the things we're doing. We've set up the, uh, the organization at Leatherneck, which, uh, which uh, examines Marines and helps them with the rehabilitation. And the final thing, uh, Congressman, is, is that we're in the process now of deploying an MRI into Camp Leatherneck. Uh, that should happen this year. And that will then give uh, the, the local folks an opportunity to, to examine the brain and then send that uh, information digitally back to the United States of America for analysis. So great recognition. It's real. Uh, we're doing something about it. I think the concussive protocol will probably save mental lives down the road yet to be seen. Thank you. Thank Mr. you, Mr. Aiken. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, uh, thank you, uh, our uh, witnesses here this morning. Uh, first of all, um, Admiral Roughhead, the uh, brief that you gave, I believe, was two or three weeks ago in the SCIF, was tremendously helpful, uh, was fast-paced, but you covered a lot of territory and, uh, and uh, maybe quieted a lot of fears on, on certain people relative to naval capabilities and some of the new threats. Uh, that was a, a very helpful briefing. and. Uh, uh, also, um, General Amos, thank you for taking time to review um, the EFV decision that you'd worked uh, through. Um, I still have some reservations, as you know. Uh, we'll probably have a committee hearing about it just to, to try to look into that. But um, I appreciate your availability uh, and your candor in saying this is what we're trying to do. Um, and uh, as you know, uh, uh, Mr. Secretary and General Amos, we're Part of our job is to say, wait a minute, we think you guys are, are being uh, too good of soldiers in terms of maybe being too tough on the budget, and there may be some times where we need to push back. Uh, we have tried to do that, members of this committee, um, making the case that the overall national budget problem can't be fixed by cuts to defense, and that that may be very unwise. Certainly the number of uh, 288 ships that were the same place we were in 1916 uh, is not something that gives us a lot of sense of peace here. Um, and you've heard me complain before that the, the more that you can include us uh, in the process and help us to go to bat for you, uh, particularly uh, uh, General Amos, in terms of your reset necessity uh, because of having had all this equipment deployed for so long, um, we want to try to help you in that regard. Uh, help us to help you in giving us as much heads up as you're making different decisions and things are going along instead of catching us. And you know that's been my continuous complaint, and I don't need to repeat it too much. Um, but your, all three of your availability, uh, we're very appreciative. The, um, we're supposed to know something about the political situation of what's going on, and, and we, as you know, the House did pass uh, an appropriations bill 
because we understand the pressure that you're under. Um, however, uh, we're not the only players in this game, and uh, so far that hasn't gone anywhere. Uh, my recommendation is that you prepare uh, just as um, Secretary uh, and, and uh, a number of you listed off, I forget who was it who made the list today, but you listed off some of the things where you need transfer authority uh, when, if we're continuing on this continued resolution approach. I think it would be good to have a second arrow, and that would be put together the most important transfer authority requirements that you need uh, so that we can go to bat. And if we have to include those in, uh, I, I, we can't do it in this uh, little short continued resolution as I understand it because the, the bus has left the station, but uh, we may well be back at another one of these Band-Aid type things. And if we do have the key transfer authority things that you need, it may allow us to try to help you. Uh, you might think that uh, a couple of, uh, particularly a certain subcommittee chairman, is a pain in the rear for complaining about you making decisions and not telling us ahead of time, but we're also, on the other hand, fighting in your behalf. And, um, and we're trying to be a team player and a help. And uh, we may be able to get some of those key transfer things through, even if we don't have uh, the appropriations piece fixed, because uh, we are in a, a period of tremendous budget instability, as you know. Um, the case that we've been making uh, as a member of the Budget Committee, um, if you take a look at the simple numbers, our revenues are $2.2 trillion. Maybe you know this, maybe you don't. $2.2 trillion, that's how much money comes in. And our entitlements plus debt service is $2.2 trillion. So we can zero defense and it doesn't solve the problem. And so we're making that case that we have to deal with this other budget problem aside from trying to continuing to whack defense and to run a Navy at the 1916 level. Uh, so help us to help you, but do help us by giving us this, the most important transfer authority pieces that you need. Uh, that was, so that was really all I had. Unless you, if you want to respond, I, I've got a few seconds left here. So. Thank you, Congressman. And just to respond very quickly on a couple of issues. One is, um, it's not just transfer authority that we're lacking. It's New START authority. That's what is really uh, going to hamper us so much on ship construction, for example. And you pointed out that we're, as the CNO said, at 288 ships, the lowest since 1916. But uh, if we build our five-year and then 10-year shipbuilding plan, uh, we will get to around 325 ships in the early 2020s. So we will pass the 313 floor and we will go up uh, to the mid 320s uh, in the early 2020s, but we won't be able to do that absent uh, New START authority to build the second Virginia class submarine, the two Aegis class destroyers, the mobile landing platform. Uh, so I would, I would add that. Thank you. Thank you. Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and gentlemen. Thank you once again for being before our committee. Uh, Secretary Mavis, uh, February of last year, your, the Department of Defense took a, what I believe is a commendable step in um, reversing the ban uh, that prohibits women from being on uh, Navy, Navy submarines. And as you probably know, I've been a strong advocate to allow women to fulfill all the um, positions currently available in our military. And um, I hope more of that happens. So, Secretary, can you provide our committee with an update now, a year later, how that's going? Um, and if it's been successful, and what more do you need? Do you need anything from us to, be, to ensure that that goes well? Well, thank you. And I, I share that, that uh, women should be absolutely integrated into all parts of the Navy in particularly the submarine community. We are moving forward. The first group of women um, are in nuclear power school and in submarine training, uh, preparing to um, go on board our ballistic missile submarines and our guided missile submarines at the late this year is the best estimate that we have. Um, the level of volunteers that um, when, when we made this announcement from both the Naval Academy and uh, ROTC programs around the country was simply astounding. 
and uh, the, the quality of the young women that are going through these, uh, this program heading for our submarines is as high as can be imagined. Now, we're also moving laterally some supply corps officers uh, to be department heads on submarines and act as mentors uh, for these new submariners, and that is also uh, coming along. Uh, we, and finally, we notified Congress in December of our intent to begin to do design work uh, on our attack submarines so that women could also be integrated into those. But we think that at this point, it's going uh, very, very smoothly. Great. That's great to hear. I wanted to give the opportunity to um, one of our members who's sitting very close to you. That would be um, uh, Miss Hannah Busa because she represents Hawaii, which you know the Navy and Marines are very important too. Uh, she sits on the what we call the bottom row, which means she probably never gets to ask a question very often. I don't know with the rest of my time if uh, the gentle lady from Hawaii would have some questions for you. Mr. Chair, is that acceptable? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, gentlemen. I would like to uh, understand something uh, which is, um, and I hope I'm not overstepping uh, Congresswoman Bardello's question, but in, in the whole concept of the Guam situation, I noticed that there's reference to the fact that the budget request includes $33 million intended to move uh, to other agencies to mitigate the infrastructure and socioeconomic impacts of Guam associated with the move of the Marines. Can you explain to me exactly what the concern is that $33 million would have to be diverted for that specific purpose? One of the keys to the Guam strategy is one Guam and one government here, that we are a total all of government solution uh, and not just the Defense Department moving toward that. That was the rationale for moving that because other agencies would have a, um, a more direct interest and ability to do some of the things that will need to be done uh, to, to make the Guam move uh, go forward. So do you sense that there's going to be some resistance or uh, concern raised by the people of Guam uh, of this move? And is that's why the almost a proactive action of, of taking steps to ensure that, it's, that you're addressing various types of social issues before the move? We have been working very closely with the, the government of Guam and with the people of Guam. Um, We've had a lot of uh, public input uh, before the environmental impact statement record of decision was signed last fall. Uh, the governor of Guam is here now um, and has been meeting uh, with the um, Department of Defense and Department of Navy officials about this. My uh, undersecretary, Bob Work, has uh, recently returned from his uh, fifth or sixth trip to Guam and we are endeavoring to work very closely uh, to meet uh, any cultural concerns, any concerns that the people of Guam have uh, as this move proceeds. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you Mr. Forbes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General Amos, I wish I had the words to adequately thank you for what you've done for our Marine Corps and what our Marine Corps does every day for our country, but suffice to say we appreciate it uh, a great deal. And, Admiral Ruffhead, I've known you for years, and I know your heart for and service to our Navy, and we thank you. And, Mr. Secretary, thank you for being here today. One of my big concerns is when you look at uh, the recent review by the Quadrennial Defense Review Independent Panel, which, as you know, is a bipartisan panel made up of some very talented individuals, it concerns you when you hear the word train wreck associated where they think we're headed with the recent QDR. And they mentioned specifically the Navy and the need for us to grow the Navy. And then it concerns me when we see the Secretary of Defense coming in, as he did last year, talking about the shipbuilding plan and saying that the out years of the shipbuilding plan are simply a fantasy. Uh, as you know, our shipbuilding plan, we're looking at how many ships we're going to have 
uh, both short term and, and down the road. It's a pretty simple calculus. It's the number of ships we plan to build uh, added to the number that's going to be in our fleet less what we decommission. OMB disagrees with the number of ships that, as you know, that the Navy projects. They think we're headed towards 270 and not uh, in the 300s. But suffice that, uh, or just put that aside for a moment, I'm concerned about the ships we have in our fleet and specifically the estimated lives of those vessels because, as you know, two things have happened. One, we've used them a lot more than we anticipated. But secondly, um, we, we know that we have had uh, just in two fiscal years, um, FY10 and, and I mean 2010 and 2012, we've had $567 million of deferred maintenance. When will we receive a revised assessment showing not the initial estimated lives of those vessels, but the current estimated projections of the life expectancies of those vessels? Is that in the works at any time for us to get? Congressman, if I could address one little part of Please. the earlier statement yes. um, in the QDR review that was conducted, as you said, by some very distinguished Americans looking at that. They came up with a number of ships for the Navy that was higher than, than our plans uh, get us in the early 2020s, which is in the 325 ship range. The major difference, though, is in the way they counted ships. Um, we do not count certain support ships uh, that, uh, that they did count. And if you count apples to apples in those two documents, we're very close to where they think we need to be in the early 2020s. In terms of maintenance, we are very concerned because, as the CNO says, uh, the Navy resets in stride. Maintenance is our, is our reset. And we are concerned that all our ships reach the total lifespan that we expect of them. The CNO has established for each class of ship an engineering-based maintenance plan so that they will reach the end of their lifespan. We are moving sailors from shore afloat. 2,200 sailors will go into the fleet for optimum manning of our ships so that more maintenance, so more preventative maintenance will occur on a routine basis. 400 um, uh, sailors are moving to the pier for intermediate maintenance so that as ships come in for their scheduled maintenance calls, uh, those maintenance calls are more valuable and, um, and make more of a difference. Mr. Secretary, I don't, I don't want to interrupt I, you, I, but I'm losing but, my time. Uh, but but because, of, because of these things that we are doing, we think that the ships are going to reach the end of their, of their scheduled life. I see. And, and that's, it was a long answer, and I apologize no, for no, that. But, I appreciate uh, the answer. Uh, the other question I have for you is, we know that uh, we, we've had officials from the Navy talking about doing a, a new force structure assessment to look at if that number is correct or not correct. And, and I'm always concerned when we talk about getting strategy but limiting based on physical realities. Um, how can we be confident that when that assessment is done, um, we know the part of it that's strategy versus the part of it that's being driven simply by budgetary concerns? Well, Congressman, the, the force structure review of the n number of Navy ships, which is uh, underway and which will be completed soon, um, we're basing it all on what we need on strategy. Um, but we are also very mindful that we need to be good stewards of the taxpayers' money, that we try to be, try to make use of every single dollar that we get um, so that we can get to the number of ships. But uh, this is a bottom-up strategic review uh, that's not budget-driven but uh, mission-driven. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Mr. McIntyre. Thank you. Thanks to all three of you for your leadership. I have one question for each of you, so in my time allotted, I'll try to get each of these questions done. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I appreciate the opportunity to be with you and the Secretary of Agriculture last year when the Biofuels Agreement was signed at the Pentagon and also to be at the maiden flight of the Green Hornet uh, last year on Earth Day. On page 27 in your testimony, you mentioned your five energy goals um, and wanting to generate at least 50 percent of all energy from alternative sources. With the F-35 coming online, is there an effort even now 
to make sure that it can operate on biofuels rather than waiting to have to convert it later? There, one of the requirements we have for any biofuel that we use is that it, it's a drop-in fuel that it can be used in any engine that we have. Um, so the, the Green Hornet was not modified in any way to, to fly on biofuels. Uh, same will be true for the F-35. The fuel will have to match that, and so far they all have. All right, great. Thank you, sir. Uh, General Amos, on page 14 of your posture report, you mentioned MARSOC, which of course has its headquarters in North Carolina. Has the Marine Corps resolved the issue of whether MARSOC personnel will remain within MARSOC in the special operations community for life, or will they rotate back to conventional forces? And is this affecting the numbers in terms of your consideration for the growth of MARSOC? Congressman, we have, uh, when MARSOC is fully stood up after the, uh, they get the latest crunch of 1,000 Marines, uh, they will be about 3,600 strong. Of that 3,600, there is uh, roughly about 815 what we call uh, critical skill operators. And those are those Marines that have the, the ultimate in training. They are, they are the real special operators. They will have their own military occupational specialty uh, uh, designation. They will remain in MARSOC, that 815, mm -hmm. for, for more, unless they want to come out. But, but they're going to be remain in MARSOC probably for the length of their career. The other remaining uh, 1,800 will, uh, will rotate out of MARSOC. They're, they're, those are communicators. Those are UAV uh, uh, folks. Those are CI Humid folks. They will come out at five-year marks, come back to the Fleet Marine Force, and as a uh, rising tide, raise all boats uh, in the Marine Corps while they spread uh, their goodness that they learned in MARSOC. So we have solved it, and there is a portion that will remain in MARSOC for the remainder of their uh, time in the Marine Corps. All right. Thank you, sir. And uh, Admiral Roughhead, thank you for coming to Wilmington, North Carolina last fall for the commissioning of the USS Gravely, the Navy's newest destroyer and named for the first African-American admiral in the United States Navy. Um, I know that on page 7 of your testimony, you mentioned specifically reducing risk with regard to purchasing more F-18 Super Hornets. Um, we understand in the next decade there's an assessment of a shortage of about 65 aircraft uh, later in this decade. What risk do you see that could make the strike fighter shortfall rise even higher in the years ahead and how we may have to complement this with the Super Hornet? Um, right now, sir, I think that we're in a very good position with the uh, new Super Hornets that are in this budget. There are nine, uh, as you know, pending on the Hill. Um, and, and then the service life extension program that we have funded in this budget. I'm very comfortable with the 35C that's coming along. So what we have been able to lay in and with the support of uh, Congress, I think we have a good way forward on our strike fighter shortfall and you know, we'll continue to, to watch uh, the, the development of the, the F-35C, but I feel very good about how we position ourselves for that future. All right. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, very much. We got it all done. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have uh, <laughs> questions that I'd like to submit for the record, and because he is the, the last one uh, to ask a question, I'd like to yield my time to Mr. Palazzo. Gentleman is recognized for four minutes and 50 seconds. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, kind of caught me off guard there, but I appreciate it. Uh, General Amos. There was recently an article in the Washington Times that stated that American combat troops will get sensitivity training directly on the battlefield about don't ask, don't tell, instead of waiting until they return to their home base in the United States. The article goes on to say that no units will be exempt. In your professional military opinion, do you believe that performing sensitivity training of this nature in anticipation of the repeal of don't ask, don't tell, while in theater is the best use of military resources at this time? Congressman, we have uh, about we've done the math now. We have many units on the ground in Afghanistan that make the 20,000. We've turned several units over. Those that are coming in have already, uh, we've rushed to make sure that they had the training before they left. We estimate about 11 units, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Command battalions and squadrons, that will need to get the training, what we call Tier 3 training, while they're in Afghanistan. Uh, uh, honestly, uh, I, I'm not concerned about that. Uh, I don't look at it as sensitivity training, by the way. I look at it as leadership training. Uh, and my sense is, is that I've got good lieutenant colonels, good company commanders, 
and they'll know precisely when the optimum time is. Not every Marine in combat is busy 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, as you know from your former life. So there will be opportunities where Marines will be able to sit down with their company commander, their company first sergeant, their squadron commander, and have that leadership training. Uh, I don't think it will be onerous. I think it will be focused purely on leadership principles, those things that, that, are, that are near and dear to Marines, uh, and I think actually it will be a lot easier to do in combat than we thought, than, you, than we might think otherwise. All right. Thank you, General. I yield back my time. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Andrews. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Secretary, welcome. It's good to see you. And on page 17 and 18 of your testimony, you make reference to the littoral combat ship dual block procurement strategy, which I agree with. I think has been very beneficial for the department and for the country. And you, you indicate that you're projecting savings of approximately $1.9 billion over a five-year period uh, on, the, L, on the, the program at a cost of $440 million per ship. Um, to what would you attribute those cost savings from the dual block strategy? In other words, what's the, the wisdom of the strategy that generates those savings? A couple of things. One is competition. Uh, we've got two variants. They competed against each other and drove the prices down significantly. Uh, secondly is we've locked in those savings over the five years by signing firm fixed price contracts for 10 of each variant, so 20 ships. Right. Uh, if we, by sticking to those two things, competition and then doing firm fixed price contracts, uh, we know we're going we're gonna to get these savings. And, one of the things I think it's important to point out is that while the average is um, cost of these ships is uh, about $433 million apiece, uh, the last ship, the last two ships will cost uh, around $360 million apiece. So the cost of the ships as each ship is built is going down. Secretary, uh, so I that, uh, as you go forward, we should uh, see those savings continue. I appreciate that, and I know this is not a decision at your pay grade, but I think the chairman would be interested as well in, in exploring why that same logic doesn't apply to the JSF engine program. If there are benefits to having two competitors that create those efficiencies over the long term, why doesn't that argument apply to the second engine? Well, if I could take... Um, a crack at it at my pay grade. Um, <laughs> we always plan to have two competitors uh, for for the littoral combat ship, and we have paid for all the engineering and R and D, the upfront cost of that. That makes it different from the alternate en engine in that the alternate engine um, or the the engine was seen as one, and you would have to pay for all the development costs for a second engine. Uh, that's a huge difference. I, I do appreciate that, although I would respectfully say that it looks like the savings over time would let you catch up and dwarf what it would cost to catch up with, with the, the, the uh, R&D outlay. But thank you. Let me move on to General Amos, um, his comments about the amphibious combat vehicle. And I guess I see your comment that um, you're going to begin development of an affordable and capable ACV um, to replace the EFV program. When do you think that the alternative would be fieldable? I mean, under optimal circumstance, we go from where we're sitting this afternoon to where we'll be able to get those vessels in the water. What's the optimal timetable to make that happen? There, there's two answers to that. One is the Commandant of the Marine Corps' answer, which is before I leave office uh, four years from now, really three and a half years from now, we will yes, have sir. a program of record. We will have steel, will be a vehicle, and I'll be able to drive it. That's yes, my sir. answer. If you answer, I, I like that answer. Okay, yeah. that's the answer. And uh, I'm trying to pressurize industry. I'm trying to pressurize uh, the acquisition uh, 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 professional uh, uh, folks. Uh, I want the word to get out. If I go by the standard acquisition timeline, which in some cases got us to where we are today, it'll be 2024. So you understand the exigency, yes, and we will have a vehicle by the time I give up this job. What, what would you say the two or three main impediments are to you achieving that objective by the time you link, relinquish your job? 
I think it's, uh, first of all, I, I have, uh, in this case, I'm on reasonably solid ground because I have the full support of uh, my service secretary, uh, his acquisition professional, uh, uh, Sean Stackley. I have the full uh, support of the Secretary of Defense and uh, Dr. Ash Carter, who is AT&L. So they are all behind it, and they're going, what we'd really like to do is use the MRAP model. Understanding the MRAP model was probably too aggressive, and, and, but it saved lives. But so something probably that resembles the sense of urgency of the, of the MRAP, but, but probably a little bit more scheduled. And that's what we're going to use. We're going to try to move everything to the left. Permit one moment of advertising. Um, you guys did a terrific job on the MRAP without Chairman Hunter, former Chairman Skelton, former member Gene Taylor, and some others. That would have never happened. And for those who think Congress should not have a direct role in spending decisions here, I would refer you to the MRAP decision. I, I yield back. I thank you for your answers. Uh, thank you, and I appreciate the uh, gentleman's question. You're right. I am also interested in it. My recollection is that the department also planned for two engines uh, originally in the JSF acquisition strategy. And if we were a couple of years down the road, we will have already we would have already paid for those acquisition costs as we did with the LCS, and then we would have the opportunity of realizing the competition going forward. Thank you. Mr. Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm, I'm a little taken aback by the answer of, of what the time frame is on the um, follow-on on EFV. I mean, because I, I, I'm very concerned about that, that whole decision process and, and the answer, because, again, your answer is, is a time frame that does not have anything to necessarily reflect on the, the threat. I mean, the time that your finish being commandant doesn't really answer the question of, well, when, um, when, when is it going to be needed? Here's my concern on the whole question of the, the EFE. Um, the, um, we know that there's no funding in FY 2012. Um, the, um, both you and the Secretary have reaffirmed the requirement to conduct amphibious, amphibious assault missions. Um, and you intend to develop, as you were just describing, something else. But the, um, as, the, as the Secretary was giving us the answer of his cuts when he announced that there was going to be a cut with this, this vehicle, um, he says the most plausible scenarios requiring power projections from the sea could be handled through a mix of existing air and sea systems employed in new ways along with new vehicles scenarios that do not require the exquisite features of the EFV. Can you describe of the analytical work Secretary Gates is referring to his, in his statement? And was there a report done? And, and the EFV, also it's my understanding that there were, there's a cessation of uh, the testing phase, and I'm a little worried about our ability to, um, to mine or ascertain the, the innovations uh, with respect to the vehicle. Um, if I could have your thoughts. Sir, on your, on your last point, uh, uh, the acquisition decision memorandum was released about uh, two or three uh, weeks ago, uh, giving 60 days for the Secretary of the Navy to, uh, and the Department to take a look at uh, how to, uh, how to uh, shut down the current EFV line. Uh, the, the forecast is, is to take the, the best of what's left in the testing for this year, for this fiscal year, and continue on with that. Those decisions are working through right now. So what you'll do is you'll capitalize between now and the end of this year, the end of the contract, uh, on those things that are probably going to be the most fruit-bearing as it relates to the EFV. The whole concept is to take those, those technologies, those lessons learned, and then apply them to the amphibious combat vehicle. So that the shutdown of the line is, 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 is in work right now, uh, but it will be done uh, uh, from my words, it will be done focused on those things that it ought to be focused on. Um, as it relates to the EFV and, and the elegance of the EFV, when those requirements were developed two and a half decades ago, uh, we looked at the threat and said it's 25 miles. That's about the farthest the naval vessel will have to go over the horizon to be able to be out of harm's way. Well, we know that that's not the case today. The enemy's not gotten any easier. He's only gotten more lethal. So as a superpower nation, we can either decide we're going to abrogate all that space, the sea space, and get out a thousand miles, or we can take the technologies and capabilities we have that we know we have right now and integrate them in the joint force 
and allow the naval vessels to come in to be able to disembark their Marines in, 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 in the new amphibious combat vehicle. That's, that's the difference uh, between the requirements as the way they were viewed in the 80s and the requirements as the way they're being viewed in 2011. Well, as we've had a lot of discussions here today about the reductions, ways to find savings, and everyone understanding that, of course, we have the cost pressures, we, we certainly also need to recognize you know, that we are a nation at war. And a lot of these cuts and reductions have an effect on, on our capabilities and on our men and women who are serving. Um, the, um, you, we have also end strength reductions that are planned, and I'm, I'm very concerned there. And I, I wanted to um, also give some of my time to um, uh, Mr. Runyon, who's down in front, but when you answer his question, could you also add any thoughts that you might have on how those end strength reductions might affect dwell time? I think people are very concerned about the ratios of dwell time. You have a goal of one to three, and um, now we're having difficulty, I believe, meeting, meeting one to two. And then I have a minute left that I'd like to, I could see to Mr. Runyon for him to add an additional question. General, gentleman's recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, the gentleman from Ohio. Uh, Mr. Secretary Mavis and Admiral Ruffhead, according to recent reports, the Aegis radar system is in the worst shape ever. Aegis is considered the world's best seagoing radar and combat system due to its power and adaptability. But training and maintenance are vital to maintaining the system's readiness out in the field. Could you please discuss any Regis fleet readiness concerns that you have and how we can help keep the Aegis radar available, a viable option once fielded. Uh, thank you very much, sir. And, and we have, uh, similar to how we've looked at all of our ship maintenance issues, we've looked at, uh, at Aegis and also how that system and the radar integrates into some other complex areas. Um, there are some things that we are working on in a technical sense that, that gets uh, to the interoperability in a, in a much better in a more reliable way than, than what I would like to see. But then we've also taken a look at what training uh, do we have to add into the pipeline. Uh, we're also adding people to those ships because as we went through an optimal manning initiative, we took people off of the ships, which ultimately gets to uh, equipment maintenance, equipment reliability. So those are just a couple of the things that we're working on. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's the the chair's intent to call two more uh, questioners and then a five-minute recess. Mr. Conway. Oh, excuse me, Mr. Langevin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, gentlemen, I want to thank uh, each of you, Secretary Mavis, uh, Admiral Ruffhead, and General Amos for your testimony here today, but most especially for all that you do uh, to protect uh, our nation. Um, let me just say that I want to talk briefly about one of our, our nation's most vulnerable strategic uh, I'm sorry, valuable strategic assets, uh, our nuclear submarine force. And we've talked about the Ohio replacement in particular uh, a bit this morning. Uh, obviously, our submariners have maintained a, a constant uh, vigilance over the past uh, decades to provide us and our allies with strategic deterrence that uh, remains unmatched by uh, any other nation uh, on the planet. Uh, their work in the silent service obviously deserves our utmost respect and support. So I believe it's absolutely vital that we remain committed to projects such as the Ohio Replacement Program. I do, however, remain concerned that uh, the large investments required for this critical system will be threatened by the needs of our surface, surface fleet. Uh, Admiral Ruffhead, uh, as I understand, you recently stated support for moving the SSBNX uh, funding out of the Navy shipbuilding and uh, conversion account. And given our fiscal pressures, can you offer your vision of how that uh, could be accomplished and what legislative authority or permissions would be needed to change, to be needed uh, to be changed or, or added? And uh, in addition, uh, the Navy's, uh, uh, Navy officials recently told committee staff that uh, our programs, uh, that the program's schedule and uh, costs present, and I quote, huge challenges and tremendous risks, which we can all understand, of course. Uh, but what are your views of this program and your confidence level that the Navy uh, will meet its cost and schedule uh, uh, goals given the critical importance uh, of this program? Uh, thank you very much, sir. And uh, my comments relative to the SSBNX dealt with the fact that the that submarine is being recapitalized in the, tw in the decade of the 2020s. And at that time, there are several things that are going to happen. Many of the submarines and surface combatants that we built in the 80s are going to be aging out and retiring from service during that decade. 
that's when we are starting to lay in the SSBNX. On top of that, we'll be building uh, the carriers on five-year centers. So there'll be uh, likely two carriers built during that same time. Uh, we are also going to be refueling our aircraft carriers, which are, that's not inexpensive. And at that time also, we're going to be decommissioning some of the earlier Nimitz-class aircraft carriers. So in the 20s, you have a fairly significant uh, demand being placed on, on the shipbuilding account and also on the shipbuilding infrastructure. Um, and, and so I do believe uh, that that has to be examined. Uh, the recapitalization of the surface fleet, recapitalization of uh, the ballistic missile submarine with everything else going on, I believe requires some different thinking. With regard to legislative authorities, uh, my sense it's really a question of, of how the budget is laid in for that. I'm not sure that there's a legislative piece, but I would leave that um, more to, to you uh, uh, to have a view of that. I'm very comfortable with where we're going with SSBNX. Uh, the decision and the recommendation that I made with regard to the number of tubes, uh, launch tubes, uh, are consistent with uh, the new START treaty. They're consistent with the missions that I see that ship having to perform. And even though it may be characterized as a cost-cutting measure, I believe it sizes the ship for the missions it will perform. Um, we are not backing off on the stealth imperative that that ship must have because the last one of that class will be on patrol in 2080. And so we have to make sure that we've built in the stealth. Uh, I'm very comfortable with our knowledge of how we've been able to bring down the cost on Virginia to apply that to the SSBNX, and, and I'm uh, very positive about where we're headed with it. Thank, thank you, Admiral. Uh, also, on, a, on another topic uh, that's been uh, important to me, uh, uh, cybersecurity, uh, uh, for Secretary Mavis or Admiral Ruffhead, um, let me just talk about uh, cybersecurity threats to our critical infrastructure in particular. Uh, let me just say that I, I've been relatively disappointed uh, by the overall lack of response and, and commitment to this issue, uh, and I firmly believe that America is still vulnerable to a cyber attack against our electric grid, and, uh, with, which would obviously cause severe damage not only our critical infrastructure but to our economy and the welfare of our citizens. We need to pay more attention to this issue. Uh, because of this concern, last Congress I posed the question to heads of cybersecurity for all of our military services. And the question basically was, if our civilian power systems are vulnerable, what's being done to protect our numerous military bases that rely on them to operate? So the answers, though, were disturbing but not surprising. Specifically, uh, Vice Admiral uh, Barry McCullough, uh, head of the Navy's 10th Fleet, testified, and I quote, these systems are very vulnerable to attack, end quote. So noting that uh, much of the power and water systems for our, our naval bases are served by single sources that have only very limited uh, backup capability. Uh, with an attack on our power station, with, it, with an attack on a power station potentially requiring weeks or even months to recover from, our bases could face serious problems maintaining operational status. What is the Navy doing to address these threats not only to uh, its critical infrastructure but also its secure and unsecured networks? Gentlemen's time has expired. Could you please uh, give him those answers on, for the record, please? Mr. Conaway. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, uh, welcome. Glad you're here. Uh, just an aside, I want to associate myself with uh, Mr. Andrews' comments. I do believe competition works. It works for the LCS, and I think it works across uh, uh, most of our platforms, at, uh, including the, uh, the engine. Uh, but I'd like to turn my, our attention to something a whole lot more less exciting and more mundane than uh, uh, than cyber attacks and everything else it has to do with back office at the Navy um, and, and your inability to uh, provide taxpayers of this country with audited financial statements of the sums of money that we uh, uh, that we give or provide through the appropriations process. I want to brag right up front: Marine Corps has taken the lead, as they typically do on most things. And, and that uh, uh, rumor has it that uh, the September. 30, 2011 financial statements will get audited uh, by the Marine Corps and will we'll pass an audit. That same issue needs to be spread across all branches. I had this conversation with the, uh, with the Secretary and, uh, uh, and others as well. Um, nothing in your, in your written statements that I was able to see uh, made reference to this issue at all. Uh, and without top-down leadership, uh, this isn't going to happen. I've met with the, with the next layer below you guys, uh, uh, with Robert Hale and others, uh, your, your counterparts for the Navy and the Marine Corps, 
and the Army and others, and, and they get it. They're ready to go in, and they're, and they're making the efforts to do that. But without uh, you two saying, make it happen, then this isn't going to happen. I'm also concerned, and would appreciate your comments, reference to all of the cost savings and cuttings and, and redeployments and swaps around that's going on. I'm concerned that you will cannibalize the uh, resources needed to make this happen uh, in efforts to uh, redeploy those resources somewhere else. As in, in my final comment as to why this is important, over and over and over this morning you've talked to us about greening uh, the military and how much that's going to quote unquote save us. I've, I've got professional skepticism about that number. You cannot tell us today what the differential between what we would have spent had we ignored the greening effort uh, versus all we spent on this. You, don't, you can't tell me that delta. And, and if we're going to eliminate the, the uh, expeditionary fighting vehicle because we quote unquote can't afford it, then taxpayers need to know what it is we're doing and why. Uh, and so uh, give me a, some sense as to uh, your commitments to making this happen sooner than later in terms of uh, getting the, the back office in a shape that uh, it can be audited. Congressman, as a former elected state auditor of Mississippi, good, glad uh, to hear that. I, um, I understand very well the importance of what, what you're talking about here. And I want to echo what you said about the Marine Corps. Uh, the Marines are very close to, um, to being able to do that. I want to also assure you that the entire Department of the Navy is taking this very seriously and working very hard on it. Um, we have um, two major issues. One is um, legacy systems, just the, the sheer number of legacy systems yeah. that we have out there and the amount of effort that it's taking to, to convert those. But we're doing it, and we're also presenting our financial statements to you uh, in GAP form and in meeting uh, the FASB regulations. Secondly, uh, one issue that we're working with um, GASB on is uh, coming up with an accurate cost for our assets. Um, for example, USS Enterprise was built more than 50 years ago in the 60s. Uh, going back and finding an accurate cost at that time is, is just onerous. It uh, is going to require a lot of time, it's going to require a lot of effort, and we won't get much for it. Uh, in, the, in the end. So we're working to try to come up with a good cost figure structure so that we can move to the audited financial statements. Uh, if I could say one word on the energy initiatives. Um, one is over the next five years, we can show absolutely that we're going to save a billion and a half dollars by okay. uh, well, some of these Well, if you've got the accounting systems in place that allows us to rely on those numbers, uh, I'd, I'd appreciate it. In the closing comments, I agree with you. Figuring out what Fort Hood costs or a 50 or 60-year-old aircraft here, let's don't let that be the, uh, the reason why we don't audit and put in place the things you use every day to run your business. Uh, and, and we're, I'll be glad, but we're working with GASB to try to figure out a different standard for the only customer, the federal government. I mean, the, the fixed asset side is, uh, is important, but let's don't let that be the, the, uh, the enemy of, the, of what we need to get done. So appreciate that. Yield back. Thanks for your comments. Thank you. We will now take a uh, five-minute recess and reconvene at one minute to 12.